We're so glad that you are here. Uh, hope you enjoyed yourself. Amen. Uh, <laughs> the two messages that we had this morning. Just, I'm one of those guys that was sit, sitting out there when uh, <coughs> when the announcer got up and made the comment. If, if I was an elder or a preacher or whatever out in that audience, I'm telling you, he stepped on my toes. <laughs> I got bruised feet this morning, which is good. That's, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. It wakes, wakes this up. Keith Harris is teaching us about restoring our vision of Jesus, which will be part one right now, part two at 11 o'clock. So come back at 11 to finish, to finish listening to what he has to say about this morning. Uh, he is uh, speaking to us about a, a world filled with chaos. It is easy to lose sight of the one we have been called to follow. And I'll let him continue on with that. Pete Harris served as a preaching minister at Wingsong Church of Christ in North Little Rock, Arkansas. He has a wonderful wife and two great kids. He has been involved in ministry for over 20 years. He moved to the Little Rock area in 2012 and, was, and has enjoyed ministry and serving in Central Arkansas. He and his beautiful wife, Lindsay, met at Crowley Ridge College, Perigo, Arkansas. They completed their undergraduate studies at Harding uh, University in 2004. Keith continues studying uh, and earning a master's degree in ministry from Harding in 2008 and a master in science in Bible and ministry in uh, 2013 from Lubbock Christian University. After completing their studies at Harding, Keith and Lindsay became, uh, began to minister to the youth at North Heights Church of Christ in Batesville, Arkansas. They spent the next eight and a half years in Batesville before moving to Little Rock in 2012. Lindsay served as the Wingsong, Wingsong Children's Coordinator, developing all children's curriculum and activities for kids ages two through six. Lindsay has been a tremendous blessing to the work at Wingsong and a wonderful help for Keith as they minister together. And I'm looking forward to hearing his message this morning. Keith, Amen. You're up. He read it just like I wrote it. So that's <laughs> Not even sure where you got all that information. <laughs> but thank you. It's, man, it's a pleasure for me to be able to be here. Uh, last year was my first year to be a part of the Sunset Workshop. And uh, just a tremendous experience for me. Back in October, I had the privilege of uh, going over to uh, the European Vision Workshop and spending time with Doug and Tim and, and others as well. Uh, many of you are familiar with Bill McDonough and his work, Partners in Progress. And uh, Bill uh, serves with us at Winsong and has been with that congregation since 1969. Uh, Winsong has been 
uh, supporting that work. And so uh, my, uh, my connection with Sunset goes back um, really to the year 2000 when I first met Truett and, uh, and then had his son Scott at Harding. And Scott and I became real good friends. Scott is kind of one of my mentors as well. And so I feel like I've been a part of uh, Sunset or at least known much about Sunset for a long time. And I just wanted to say that I'm honored to be here and to spend this time uh, in this class together. Let's start with a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for who you are and for being our God. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And we pray that you would continue to shower upon us uh, those rich blessings that you give to us in Christ. And Father, we pray that you would be with us this morning as we study from your word. Help us to uh, understand better who you've called us to be and help us to have a better understanding of who your son is. And I pray, Father, that as we face a difficult world, uh, one that's filled with uh, challenges uh, revolving around truth and uh, the changing of truth. And Father, I pray that you would help us to stand firm in our faith and in our knowledge of you, but help us to continue to search out and to grow and to be strengthened in you. Father, again, we are so thankful for this opportunity to be together this morning and to study. We praise you. We thank you for Jesus, and for his sacrifice for us. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to forgive us when we fall short of your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Let me say at the very outset, I would love for this to be what it should be. I don't want to just lecture. I'm, I'm glad to talk, and I can talk for a long time. But if you've got a comment or a question, please feel free uh, to, to raise your hand, speak up, or just interrupt me if you've got a concern or a question that you'd like to talk about a little bit more. You ever think about images and the images that we see? There, you know, this is really what our world has come to be, especially uh, media. Uh, it's all about the image. And I'm not talking about just the perspective of what people think about it, but an image. And a lot of images are kind of confusing. Maybe if you're not uh, ready for uh, the deeper meaning of the image, you may have difficulty understanding what's going on there. There's commercials uh, that are out today, and, and I think about them, and I look at them and say, what, what in the world is this about? Have y'all seen the new Apple commercial, um, the Retina? Uh, Y'all seen that where people just start running? And it's like they're running out of a prison and they're all wearing jumpsuits and you watch it for a minute and for most of the commercial I'm thinking, what in the world is this about? And then at the end they hit you with the color. They're talking about color. And so then it makes sense, but it's really confusing. There are other images that we see. I'll show you this one. This will work. It's not going to. I'll remember that image. <laughs> but what color is that dress? Did we ever figure out what color that dress was? Blue? So who said who thinks it's blue? Blue and black, okay. Who thinks it's white and gold? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> wow, y'all are I guess, you know, in reality that's what it ends up being. Is, is actually white and gold. And it's the shadowing of the picture that was taken that makes it look blue and black. Um, it's interesting what images do to our minds and how we differ. And I'm surprised that all of you thought blue and black, and may, maybe it was a, you know, a the difference of what we were thinking, but this picture obviously on the screen looks blue. Yeah, it, it does, and I, and I admit that as well. Uh, and you remember the internet sensation that occurred over this dress and people wondering about what color it was, the arguments back and forth. Sometimes we're just confused by images and sometimes we're divided by images. Uh, what, about, what about this image? Who is that? An artist rendition of Jesus. Yeah, that's one of them. Look how manicured he looks. His, his eyebrows scaped. His, his lips, his beard. Yeah. I wonder if he had a dimple there that made that do that. What about this one? And you think about that particular image, 
and you see it as well. He's got his skin. In every depiction of Jesus, it seems like his skin is perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, his beard is always groomed. Yeah. He looks very sharp. Even in a toga. I guess that's a toga. I'm not sure what you would call that necessarily. But even in the, the hood or the, uh, the outer garment that's draped over his head, he looks sharp, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. This one is my personal favorite. This one's a new one. <laughs> so, again, he's got the good beard, he's got the long flowing hair, and he's got the nice glasses going on. Images are something I think that a lot of times we get confused about. And I think the image of Jesus is one of those that we get uh, greatly confused a lot because we tend to want to shape Jesus and, and, and mold him into who we think he ought to be. Mm. And we see in the New Testament, uh, the, the people that were waiting for the Messiah, they had this vision or this image in their mind of what that Messiah was going to be. And they were confused by it. And they were especially confused when they see Jesus coming on the scene and appearing the way that he did. And that confusion brought about a great division. And so these images that we see today uh, all around us create division and confusion and images of Jesus and even portrayals that we have uh, from those that would want us to believe Jesus was something different than what Scripture uh, claims. It, it causes a lot of concern for us today. What I want us to do in this class is look at the Gospel of Mark because I think more so than any other, Mark in his Gospel sets out to show us the image of Jesus. And he wants his reader to understand who Jesus really is. And in the midst of a world that seems so chaotic, and no doubt in the first century there was a lot of chaos going on as well, that the images of Jesus, or at least the images of the Messiah, were greatly distorted. And Mark sets out to correct that and says, here's the real Jesus. So imagine that... You lived in the first century, and uh, you had a front row seat to all of the events that took place in the first century. There you were. You were in the heart of it all. Imagine that your family uh, was found smack dab in the middle of all of these great events. Imagine that the apostles maybe even knocked on your door one day. Imagine if your uncle was one of the first who got into ministry with Paul. We think about... Mark, his experience, and oftentimes our minds go to that bad experience that he had with Paul yeah. when he decides to leave on that first missionary journey. And Paul gets so upset, yeah. and there's such a uh, such a battle that ensues. I say battle, but uh, an intellectual battle that ensues between Paul and Barnabas. That now here they are; they're they're going to divide because of Mark's decision. It's that same Mark that wrote this. And I believe that even in that early stage in his life where as a young man he left what we would say is the mission field or ministry uh, to go back home, maybe because he was homesick, that same Mark is so powerful in the way that he shares this image of Jesus with us. And so he begins his gospel in chapter 1, verse 1. Listen to how he... He starts, like no other gospel. Listen, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but he adds the phrase, the Son of God. And so Mark, at the very outset of his gospel, sets out to say, here's who I'm going to talk about. I'm telling you, this is the image of the person that I'm writing about. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so Mark is very clear in who he's going to talk about. It's interesting to me that as you read through Mark's gospel, uh, the only ones that truly understand or seem to express an understanding of who Jesus really is are the demons. Everyone else in Mark's gospel is confused about who Jesus is. And that's why... That's why Mark, I believe, sets out and starts in this way. And not only that, but uh, he appeals to Isaiah as he begins writing. I want you to look at verse 9. Uh, after we're told about the coming of, of John the Baptist, we see the baptism of Jesus. And so verse 9, 
In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was uh, and baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is just the first instance in which Mark uses an external source to speak to who Jesus is. Not only that, but we see the humility of John just prior to this in, in verse 7, uh, where he is preaching. He's saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, whose strap uh, of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I've baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's pointing the way to Jesus. And so Mark uh, begins his gospel. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the good news about Jesus Christ the Son of God. And here John is. He came to prepare the way for Jesus. And Jesus, to fulfill all righteousness, we're told, goes out to John to be baptized. And he does. And we see what happens, that the heavens are open. This has always been an interesting uh, aspect of Jesus' baptism to me. Uh, this word that's used here, uh, in the Greek, it comes uh, from two separate words, uh, schizo and phrenos, and that sounds familiar to you. I know. Schizophrenia, we have our word. Do you know that word schizophrenia was not uh, coined until 1911 uh, by a Swiss uh, psychiatrist? And he coined that. Well, the two words that are put together to make that one word uh, literally mean a splitting, which is schizo, a splitting, and phrenos, mind, a splitting of the mind. And so this is the word that is used here when we say that, and when it says that the heavens were torn open. And it's not just a simple uh, tearing uh, or opening, as it were, of the clouds. You know, we have pictures uh, and images of this, where the, the clouds are parted and the sunbeams come down and all this, you know, that whole image. And it's not as though they can just be closed back. The use of this word and what they witnessed was a ripping open so as to not be able to put back together. Did you know the same word is used in Mark 15, uh, around verse 38, I believe it is, where we're told that the veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom. And that image that he's given to us right here is the image of Christ coming to fulfill all righteousness, following God's desire, and the heavens being torn open, Jesus making the way, never to be closed again. And they're torn open. When we think about this, and what Mark is representing here is the ripping open, we see God affirming a few different things. One is that he says that this is my son, and that I'm well pleased with him. And so he is acknowledging or affirming uh, Jesus place and he says this is a place of value you're my son it's a place of value not only that but he is saying that he is pleased with him and so he affirms those two things here again Mark uh, just sharing with us this reality of who Jesus is if you move along and we're going to go through this rather uh, quick this morning because we can't spend this much time on every every passage, but I want to hit some of these moments where Mark and his gospel is saying, look at him, look at this image of who he is, and also I believe how Mark shows the misunderstanding on the part of the other people that experience Jesus. So let's look at verse 21, verse 21, after they went into Capernaum uh, and immediately uh, says that they went on into the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath day. They entered the synagogue, and Jesus was teaching. Uh, they were astonished at his teaching, verse 22, for he taught uh, as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And notice this. This man with the unclean spirit cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? And notice this phrase next. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So, this is the first moment where we see the demons believing or confessing who Jesus is. They're the only ones through Mark's Gospel that really understand who Jesus is. 
And so here this man comes in with the unclean spirit, and immediately they recognize Jesus, this unclean spirit recognizes Jesus. What have you to do with us? You come here to destroy us? Why are you here? We know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. The unclean spirit, convulsing him, crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And notice verse 27. The people, they were all amazed, so they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And in verse 28, And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. So here Jesus is. Uh, casting out this unclean spirit or commanding this unclean spirit to come out of this man and the people stand amazed. And they're going, what is this? We've never seen anything like this. Even unclean spirits come out when he commands them. And so his fame begins to spread. Well, the miracles of Jesus and the miracles of the Bible can be a challenge. And Mark's purpose is to present Jesus uh, as one who... Uh, at least in this image as he presents him, that we cannot ignore. Jesus cannot be ignored. You have to deal with Jesus. And so Mark, through the miracles that Jesus performs, and as he shows it and lays it out in his gospel, helps us to come to that point where we're face-to-face -face with him and having to make that decision about what we think of God and Christ, about the image we have of who he is. Jesus is not powerless but he has great power. We see in this story that he commands even uh, Satan's agents and they obey him. Jesus has the power to defend us against Satan. and We recognize that from Scripture. He has the power to make us victorious. That's who he is, and that's what's demonstrated here for us in this short section. If we continue on to chapter 2, this is one of my favorite stories. The beginning of chapter 2, we see Jesus' fame spreading. We've just seen that in verse 28 as Mark is continuing to share this with us and un, uh, uh, unroll this uh, picture, this image of Jesus. Verse 1, familiar story to you, I'm sure. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no, no more room, not even at the door. He was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. Uh, and when they had made an opening, uh, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And now some of the scribes, I want you to... Think about that word because I look back at, for me, it's just across the page, but chapter 1, verse 22, all of the people that heard Jesus teaching on that day in the synagogue, they said, man, he's teaching with great authority, not like the scribes. The scribes were not just people who made copies. The scribes were uh, literally of the word, of the letter. And they recorded, and they knew, and they were teachers. And so here they are, hearing Jesus say, Son, your sins are forgiven. Some of the scribes were sitting there, and they were questioning, and notice this, in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So in their hearts, they're thinking this, not out loud. They're not refuting anything Jesus is doing openly, but rather in their hearts, they're questioning, why is it that he said your sins are forgiven? Well, Jesus, verse 8, immediately perceives in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves. He said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? This question that Jesus asked them uh, is a question that seems, at least to us, um, rather odd. At least it does to me. Uh, why would he say this? Well... <laughs> If we think about it on a little bit different level, Jesus is saying your sins are forgiven, which only God can do. All of us are powerless to do what God can do. And that's the scribe's argument within themselves. Why is he doing this? He's blaspheming. Nobody can forgive sins but God alone. That's the thing that's impossible for us, right, to them. 
And so Jesus asked this question, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven? Well, that's not easy. Now, you got to be thinking about it. That's not easy for me, for the scribes in this story. That's not easy for me because God alone can forgive sins. That's right. Now, I understand, and don't get me wrong, I understand we are called to forgive one another, mm-hmm. and I believe that we should. And let me say, it's difficult sometimes. Yeah. But in this context, where the scribes are wondering and questioning within themselves, who does he think he is? Mm. For him to ask the question, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to tell this paralytic to take up your bed and walk? Well, both of those seem impossible. So Jesus, in his knowledge, understands what they are thinking in their hearts and responds accordingly. And then he says, okay, I'll give it to you. If I was wanting to pretend to be someone that I'm not, I might say to him, oh, your sins are forgiven. But there's no external evidence of that. Nobody can see your sins being forgiven in this context. And so Jesus says, okay, I'll go ahead and show you. He looks at the paralytic, take up your bed, go home. And he does. And this image of Jesus having power over the physical body of this man who was paralyzed, who had to be carried by his friends to come and to be placed in front of Jesus in this moment. Jesus says, get up and walk. And he does. That has great external evidence. Everybody is going to see. These four friends who had this great faith in who Jesus was are going to see that he was able to heal this man. And so, here is part of the issue that arises from that then, following this. Jesus, uh, after he says in verse 10 uh, that he has authority to forgive sins while on earth, he tells this man to rise, take up his bed, and go home. And with that, makes the point that I am God in the flesh. You say no one but God can forgive sins. Well, so that you know that I have that authority, I'm going to tell him, get up and walk. And he does. So again, uh, through this story, one of my favorite, I wish we could spend more time on this, but I want to, I want to go ahead and move forward in this. The, uh, the next story I want us to look at is in chapter 3. I don't think I have this up there. Chapter 3, verse 1. A very similar uh, situation where Jesus encounters uh, people who are questioning why he's doing what he's doing. Verse 1, again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. They watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath and so, uh, so that they might accuse him. Verse 3, he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? But they were silent and didn't answer. And he looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. His hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Jesus again has, has this encounter with uh, the religious leaders. And here they are, not wanting to believe that he is who he says he is. That he can do the things that he says he can do. They're questioning his authority. Surely the Messiah is not going to be like you. He's not the, you're not the one that we are waiting for. You don't look like the one that we are waiting for. And so they have trouble with him again. But Jesus heals this man and shows them and leads them to this point of not being able to respond. And so they go out and privately begin Uh, discussing how they can arrest him. Well, chapter 4 now. We're going to skip quite a few. Chapter 4. At the end of this chapter, we see it's evening, and they are going to cross the sea. And so they say, and Jesus says to them, verse 35, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, he took with them, he took... uh, Took, they took him sorry, with them in the boat, just as he was. Uh, the other boats were with him, 
a, a great windstorm arose. The waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Okay, familiar, another familiar story to us, Jesus calming the storm. Here they are, out at sea. They have been following Jesus. These are the disciples that are with him, following him, watching and seeing the miracles that he's performing, watching him cast the evil spirits out of people. They're seeing all of this, and they're experiencing him day in and day out, and they've reached this point now where they're in the middle of the sea, and this great storm comes, and they're terrified. And I'm sure that I would be the same way. Uh, I'm not very keen on being out in the middle of deep water. I like it, it's okay, but not in a storm. Especially if the boat is filling up and it looks like we're going to sink because I'm not going to swim that far. Maybe I won't make it that far. That should be what I say. I might try, but probably wouldn't make it that far. And so fear takes over in their life. And in this moment, and Jesus, seemingly not caring, and that's their thought, they wake him up. Now, have you ever wondered why they wake him up? What do you think? I'm interested to hear what you think. Why they woke him up? Okay, that's that's one possibility. They want him to be scared too. Yeah. If you, go ahead, I'm sorry. How could he be asleep? Yeah. Yeah. Or get busy bailing. I think that's the reason. I really do. I don't know this for sure. She said, get busy bailing water. Yeah. Here we are. Our boat's filling up and you're sleeping. Help us. You know, use your hands. Do something. Let's get this water out of here so we can so we can be on our way. I, I'm I think that's why. I'm, at least I'm convinced or I, to myself I'm convinced that that's why. I don't have that in evidence of scripture, obviously. But that makes sense to me. That's what I would do. And I would say, well, why is he over here sleeping? We're all working so hard trying to get this water out of this boat so we don't sink. And we're terrified because we think we're about to die. Wake him up. <laughs> Tell him to help. That's... He was the leader of the group. They, they looked to him for any kind of problem that came up. And he was the solution. To it. Very possible. Yeah. <clears throat> Help us, you know, is there something else we can do, you know? Did the plug come out of the boat? No. Uh, it's a, it, you know, this story to me uh, in Mark's gospel is, I think, the turning point for the disciples, at least in Mark's perspective. And the reason that I would say that is because this is the moment at which we really see the disciples struggling. Up until this point, it's been everybody else. Now, every, everyone else has been wondering, uh, okay, uh, why is he saying he can forgive sins? Oh, okay. Uh, the unclean spirit, we know who you are. But everybody else is questioning and wondering why he's doing the things that he's doing. This is the moment at which we see the disciples of Jesus struggling to understand. Yes, sir? They were terrified. They've been terrified from the storm. The storm stops. Now they're terrified by the event itself. They go from right. one kind of terror to another. Yes. From a physical fear to a godly fear. Yeah. Something's different. Something's different. You're right. So you're saying that they're struggling with his image of what they are yeah. thinking he is. Who is yeah. That, that's what I'm. That's what I'm suggesting. I think Mark's doing that in his gospel. It's going to make more sense in just a moment, hopefully, as we see more of these evidence through the gospel. Uh, but you think about what Mark is doing. He's trying to get the reader to understand who Jesus is, and he does that by showing how everybody else misunderstands. And so he's trying to bring us along. Um, there's a man by the name of Sam Chan. Some of you may have, have heard of him. Um, Sam Chan talks about uh, the way that we talk to one another. And when you're close to someone, a lot of times you tell stories to each other. 
And he says, the greatest example of teaching that we have is seen in the New Testament, where we have stories being told, and from the master teacher who told stories to make a point. That's what Mark's doing. He's telling us these stories about these events, these encounters with Jesus, and how people misunderstood, and I think particularly how the, the disciples misunderstood. Their image of who he was isn't what it ought to be. Even after experiencing him casting out an evil spirit, after seeing him heal this paralytic, after seeing him restore this man's hand, they've, they've seen that. So why is it that they would wonder? Why is it that they would be so afraid if they know this guy raised a guy from paralysis? Surely he could do something to help us right now. But that's not their point. Their fear is the physical. We're going to die because of the storm. They wake him up, I'm convinced, not because they're thinking he can calm the storm, but because he needs to help us right now. Whether it's through his leadership or whether it's through getting a bucket or getting his hands and start to help us get this water out. Here's the key verse of this story. It's verse 41. This is Mark showing us the heart of the disciples. They were fear filled with great fear, and they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? <coughs> they don't know. They don't fully understand who he is. And in this moment, where he calms the storm and their fear is transformed from one kind of fear to another, they're questioning and saying, who is this guy? Who is he? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Yes. Well, it's also different when you're looking at a paralytic or a man with a withered hand or someone that can't see. It's different when you're looking at them mm -hmm. as opposed to when you're in the middle of the boat. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like surgery. Yeah. Everybody else has a procedure, but we have major surgery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Isn't that right? Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. I mean, I see this a lot in myself because um, you know, as a preacher, I'm counseling people all the time, and I have no doubt what Jesus is going to get them through, uh, but sometimes when that storm comes on me, I start, you know, the unknown. How's this going to work out? Is God going to let this happen or that happen? And unfortunately, uh, I'm more like the disciples than I you know. Yeah. Would like to admit it, you know. I think that's what Mark's saying to us, and he's challenging us through his gospel to really think about who Jesus is. One thing that I do want to say out of this, and I'm sure you've heard this in other lessons before, but being in the boat with Jesus doesn't keep the storms from coming. Mm, yeah, yeah. It just means that he will protect us from the storm, Amen. from being destroyed Amen. by the yeah. storm. I'll say that. So chapter 5 comes. Now we're going to hurry because we're, we've got about seven minutes. I think I was supposed to go for 45 minutes, so it's 1030. And I'm, going to, I'm going to try to get there. Is that okay? I'm going to turn that clock back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So chapter five, we, we come to this uh, story of um, the man who was demon-possessed. Here's another example of the demons understanding who Jesus was very clearly. Let's begin. I want to read it just to refresh our minds with the story and listen to the way that Mark uh, presents it to us. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one can bi could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he uh, had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. And look at this last part. No one had the strength to subdue him. Now verse 5. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Who's saying this? The demons. The demons. That's right. Okay. He, uh, 
And Jesus, in verse 9, asks him, What's your name? As if Jesus doesn't know. He says, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send, him, not send them out of the country, but uh, uh, a great herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside. And they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs and let us enter them. And he gave them, notice this, permission. That's a key word for Mark. Yeah. Gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out, entered the pigs, and the herd, uh, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And then the people came to see what it was that had happened. you got to come and see this spectacle. That's the way we are. I'm not kidding. My grandmother, who, who passed away uh, several years back, uh, <clears throat> she used to keep my sister and I when we were young during the summer. And we might be driving to Walmart or to the grocery store. I promise you, my grandmother, if she saw an ambulance, she would turn and follow it to see what happened. That's the way we are. We, we like to see spectacles. Well, everybody heard about this, and they all rush out to see what happened. And so here's the scene, verse 15. They came to Jesus. They saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had uh, had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it described to them and uh, how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. Verse 17, they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. <laughs> As he was getting into the boat, the man who had uh, been possessed by, with the demons begged him that he might be with him. And uh, he didn't permit him to come, but he said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. In verse 20, finishing this section, uh, he went away and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how, uh, how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. So the word about Jesus is getting out. The people were afraid and seeing what had happened to this man and hearing the story about how Jesus commanded these demons to run off in, into the sea. <coughs> the pigs. Chapter 6, we're going to quickly go through this. I'm not going to read it and talk about it much, but the feeding of the 5,000, we see that in chapter 6. Uh, and then we see the feeding of the 4,000 at the beginning of uh, chapter 8. So he's fed 5,000 now. He's fed 4,000. He's healed others. He's cast out demons. And we reach this point in chapter 8, and I'm going to tell you, there's 16 chapters in Mark, and chapter 8 is the crucial chapter. Mm. If we don't get chapter 8, we're going to miss everything Mark's doing. Wow. Okay, So we're going to come back to this, but I want us to look at, four, at beginning at verse 14. So they've witnessed all of this happening. They've witnessed him feeding the 5,000, they've witnessed him feeding 4,000, and here's the story, verse 19, or 14 rather, I'm sorry. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Now you've got to picture this in your mind. Here they are, getting into the boat, and they've only got one loaf of bread. And their thoughts are, what are we going to do? And not only that, but Jesus starts talking about leaven. He knows he knows we didn't bring enough bread. That's their thought. So here's verse 17. Jesus says, uh, being aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do, do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And he says, uh, do you not remember? And then he goes on to ask them, verse 19, When I broke the five loaves for 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you take up? And you can almost see them embarrassed, saying, 12. <laughs> you know, like, oh, oh yeah. And, and the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you take up? Seven. And notice verse 21. Do you not yet understand? Mark is... Very clear. That verse right there is the transition in Mark's gospel. I want us to understand, and we're going to look at this in the, next, in the next part. I want us to understand that what Mark is doing is acknowledging 
that we struggle to understand who Jesus is. We have these preconceived <coughs> notions about who the Messiah is going to be.